of Colorado, of course, waking up to this. Lots of snowfall moving into the metro area. This system stretching across about six different states around here. You'll notice the snow still coming through the metro area. A little bit of light rainfall going just to the north of the metro area, even sneaking in just because we've been watching these temperatures kind of flirting with the freezing mark all day long. A little warmer in northern Colorado, so more rain, less snow for you folks. And then further to the south, there it is, Centennial Castle Rock, a little cooler with 20s going up in the foothills where we've seen the majority of the snow and where winter storm warnings will continue until 5 a.m. tomorrow, 8 to 14 inches. And I know a lot of folks have been getting the calls have already seen upwards of about 8, 9 inches so far. Denver still under that winter weather advisory until midnight, about 2 to 5 inches coming our way with the advisories extending up to the high country, a great powder day tomorrow. Tonight, light snow temperatures cooling off to the lower 20s, so I anticipate all of the water that's out on the roads. It's going to be pretty icy overnight into tomorrow morning, so safe travels out there. You'll notice by seven o'clock still some light rain or I should say snow showers coming through across the eastern side of the state early tomorrow morning. But by midday, the system is pretty much done with the front range up in the high country, still unsettled with a little bit of light snowfall, another inch or two of accumulation. Daytime highs tomorrow sitting in the mid 30s, 30s, 40s for eastern Colorado, and then the numbers start to climb. We're back to the 40s and low 50s with a bit more sunshine next week. And Kyle, let's do it all over again next Friday with a bit more snow. Do not tell me what to do, Danielle. Grant. Oh, I am. All right. Thank you. Much of Colorado got the same wake up call this week. Did you get it? It, it was around midnight when our phones buzzed and rattled off our nightstands because that's where we all keep our phones now. And that's how they blow up when an Amber Alert is issued. Believe it or not, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation does consider the time of day or night when it sends out those jarring alerts. Our Marshal Zellinger heard it straight from the man in charge. This is the Colorado Bureau of Investigation with an Amber Child Abduction Alert. This is a test message and how CBI puts together those Amber Alerts on TV. At the same time, they sometimes blast your phone while you're fast asleep. Like Tuesday at 11.30 p.m. when one was issued for a 17-year-old taken by a boyfriend she had a restraining order against. It's kind of a coin toss there of whether or not you do that at that hour. Uh, and at, on that case, we felt that it was important to do it. CBI Director John Camper hears your concerns. He shares them too. How much good does it do if an Amber Alert's going off at two in the morning when most people are sleeping anyway, when probably what's more effective at that hour are the over, over the highway signs and things like that. So we contemplate all of these things. Amber Alert Awareness Day is Sunday, and since the program started in 1996, 941 children nationwide have been found, 55 because someone got the message on their phone. On the other hand, you don't want to overuse it and have the effect that you get now when a car alarm's going off in a crowded mall parking lot. You know, everybody just walks past it and who cares? CBI, and not Nine News, is in charge of what shows up on your TV, which in the past has been a bit jumbled, though Tuesday nights was as clear as I've ever seen. Just a finger press on the wrong button it has the potential to mess up the, the message. Because you're asking the public, do we deserve to know more in an Amber Alert case than any other case. I think some kind of explanation is reasonable. In fairness, understand that in, in many of these, there's an active criminal case going on on the other end of this. You can see how robust that looks on TV. On your phone, they're limited to just 90 characters, Kyle. It's federal government that has to upgrade that system, perhaps maybe photos in the future or a picture of the car instead of just 90 characters or less. This is what we're looking for. Yeah, at least get us to 240 like a tweet, you know? <laughs> All right, thank you, Marshall. The $20 million GoFundMe campaign to build the border wall, which is coordinated in part by a couple from Castle Rock, is now being refunded back to donors. But the organizer is asking all those donors to reroute their money to his new nonprofit corporation, which would go and build sections of the wall for the government. And guess who's on the board of that new organization? None other than Colorado's own Tom Tancredo. The GoFundMe fell far short of its $1 billion goal, so it has to issue refunds to anybody who doesn't want their money rerouted to this new private wall building operation. Tom Tancredo confirmed to me today he has agreed to serve as an advisor to the effort to privately construct some sections of border wall. The former Republican congressman and gubernatorial candidate told me he will not accept any compensation personally. A couple from Castle Rock was running the P.O. box collecting physical checks for the border wall GoFundMe. They told us that they were just trying to help out the decorated veteran behind the campaign. He's a triple amputee. He's the one who's now leading this private border wall plan. 
Our next question comes from a viewer named Kathy. She asks, are our senators and representatives accepting their pay during the government shutdown? Well, Kathy, it depends on who we're talking about. We re reached out to everybody in the delegation. Most got back to us. So we know both of our U.S. senators, Republican Cory Gardner and Democrat Michael Bennett, they plan to either give up their pay during the shutdown or donate it to charity. I think people who are in office who have the opportunity to not uh, take their salary, which is not everybody during a shutdown, uh, that we should we should do that to show that this isn't just you know business as usual. On the other hand, what we really should do is get this government reopened again. On the House side, Republicans Doug Lamborn and Scott Tipton, as well as Democrats Diana DeGette and Jason Crow, they're refusing their paychecks during the shutdown. Democrat Ed Perlmutter will continue to take his pay. His spokeswoman told us, quote, the folks impacted by this shutdown don't need nice gestures. They need their paycheck and food to provide for their families. Speaking of, Perlmutter's office in Lakewood is offering breakfast and lunch each weekday for people impacted by the shutdown. Perlmutter's spokeswoman says that's being funded by taxpayer dollars. Perlmutter's district includes the Denver Federal Center in Lakewood, which has the highest concentration of federal agencies outside the Washington area. Democratic Congressman Joe Neguse and Republican Congressman Ken Buck have not told us what they are doing with their salaries during the shutdown. Gentlemen, you know how to get a hold of us. A next viewer tweeted to me today what the government shutdown means to him and his family. He said that he's a government employee and he wants to be really careful with money while he's not getting paid. So he has decided to hold off on buying his 12 year old daughter a bike for her birthday today. He said, you know, it, it can wait. You want to know what happened next? It was Twitter, so of course it was gross. Anonymous trolls who don't have the courage to use their names online did have the courage to mock this man's family finances and his daughter. One after another, laughing at the fact that a 12-year-old wasn't going to get a bike. Apparently because cruelty is now a political philosophy. But then something else happened. Coloradans from across our state, from across the political spe spectrum, drown out that hate with generosity. There's an offer from a bike shop from some parents and grandparents. So sweet. There are offers from liberals, from a Republican politico. There's a law enforcement officer in northern Colorado who private messaged me offering bikes for the whole family. I connected that man who works for the government with a pretty well-known name in town who got in touch with me behind the scenes offering help. And I can assure you that girl's getting a bike for her birthday. Probably going to be a nice one. Now, if only we could take up a collection to get those anonymous trolls a bit of courage and compassion. Denver Public Schools has seven days now to avoid a teacher strike. The district put a new offer on the table, but it doesn't look like the union likes it. So negotiations continue after the district floated a $334 million compensation package. Union leaders say the details and the pay system structure are not good enough. The teachers union's lead negotiator says there is also an unresolved issue around simply trust. Why do you think we've developed such a mistrust of the district over the last 10 years when it comes to this subject because you're spending a lot of time on this. I can't do anything about the past. My direction now has been how do we try to create a new way of interacting with each other to be able to do that. <laughs> if the deal is not reached in one week, the teachers can vote to strike January 19th. Now remember, in Colorado, the state labor department has to approve a teacher's strike. And Superintendent Susana Cordova, who you saw there, says she would ask the state to block a strike. We told you this week about the changing face of addiction and overdoses in our state and across America. The CDC says overdose deaths among women jumped 260% over 18 years. Tonight, we can put a name and a face to that changing face a recovering addict who shares her story with our Anusha Roy. My story began when I was a senior in high school. I um, was prescribed opiates following a surgery for my wisdom teeth. Blair Hubbard says one of her strongest qualities helped hide one of her biggest secrets. Women are so resilient. I mean, I think it's, it's part of our nature. Those of us who are struggling with addiction are also able to maintain this um, disguise. Good. Somehow I graduated with my degree in radiology from Arkansas State. Um, before I was about to begin my master's degree in physical therapy, I finally came clean to my parents because I was, I was so sick. Reaching out for help was the first challenge. Finding it was the second. And during that time, Blair found heroin. What happened after you moved to Denver? 
And within probably four months, I lost everything. I lost my apartment, my car, everything I owned fit into a single trash bag. What are some of the challenges that women face to reach out for help? A lot of women are in the, in the back alleys, in the corners, and because they don't want to come out because they're too afraid to actually say, I, I need help. For some time, Blair stopped asking too, until she ended up at Lutheran Medical Center with sepsis. Even I told them that they had, they had, please, please, to treat me. What started with the prescription took a turn with the right set of doctors, and around seven years later, Blair is now an addiction counselor. I hope as we start to understand addiction better and, and are able to provide better treatment that women will slowly feel safer about asking for help. So what is happening across the country is happening for men and women here in Colorado. So is that struggle to find treatment, which is why the state is trying to launch a mobile clinic in rural Colorado. They also were updating an app mm -hmm. so that they would streamline people finding treatment options in Colorado as close as possible to them. I'm fascinated by anybody who has personal expertise or who studies the issue of addiction, what they think about the hot debate in the state legislature right now over supervised drug injection mm -hmm. sites. And you raised this with her. Yeah, so Blair thinks that it would have definitely helped her maybe use needles more safely, especially mm -hmm. since she was struggling for years to find the right kind of treatment. But you do have to remember the other side. We have talked about this before. People worried about crime, worried mm -hmm. about it encouraging drug use. And of mm -hmm. course, the feds already weighing in, saying that it would violate federal law. Different people with addictions have yep. different experiences. Just curious about hers. All right, Anusha, thank you. Times, a new museum exhibit is unrecognizable, and that's by design. We're uh, hoping that people kind of have a sense of self-discovery. In one day, park rangers in Colorado counted 67 bald eagles just passing through. And we call Bear Lake the oasis on the plains, and it's really the bed and breakfast for birds. And it's a stock show edition of Your Good News, next. The most Colorado thing we saw today are golfers who will not let snow flow in their play. Next viewer named Mary snapped a photo of a guy clearing snow off a of putting green at Saddle Rock Golf Course in Aurora. I like his optimism, if nothing else. Send your most Colorado pictures to next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. A caravan of migrants is headed for the U.S. border with Mexico. Don't worry, they're headed south. And also, they're bald eagles. They're migrating through Colorado right now. And our Steve Steger found them at Bar Lake. Bar Lake has 1,900 acres of water and about 1,200 acres of land. To hear park manager Michelle Super describe it, 
Bar Lake State Park sounds like summer camp for birds of prey. Summer camp in winter. And the lake just capped over with ice like two weeks ago, so this was all open and they really like the more open water. The latest campers here are bald eagles. So this year, one day we counted 67. A whole lot of bald eagles. We call Bar Lake the bed and breakfast for birds. We have all of this which has the water, the land. We have great habitat here. Really, there are only two permanent resident eagles here, a nesting pair that's called Bar Lake Home since 1986. But wintering eagles on their way from Canada to Mexico tend to stop in Colorado for a few months each year. Yep, many of the official birds of the U.S. only stay here as a flyover. <laughs> well, I guess it is kind of ironic. So they'll migrate from the north down here in the winter. So starting the beginning of December, we see a few more eagles. And then they'll be here probably about to the middle of February until our nesting pair starts the nest. When the resident eagles start their sexy business, the Colorado tourists know it's time to continue their journey. But in the meantime, there are plenty of chances for cool photos. And you might have one close to you. If you have a reservoir, then you're gonna have some bald eagles, some tall cottonwood trees, that's where they like to perch, and they, they're great fishermen. But hurry up, they'll likely continue their trip to Mexico in the next few weeks, because who knows how tall that wall might be. For next, I'm Steve Steger. Steve Steger, Steve Steger, start in trouble. Did you see those beautiful photos by Tom Green? Weren't they gorgeous? The one of that bald eagle turning on the magpie, you know, you're just like, USA. If you're headed out to Bar Lake, they ask that you stay on the trails. Know it's tempting to try and get close and get a better picture. It's, it's not good for the park and it's not good for the birds. Part of the Inglewood Civic Center has a new look and feel. It's sort of like walking into your favorite uh, painting or into a dream um, that's, it feels very um, surreal. Washing and rinsing and getting ready for the show. We like coming out here, we love seeing the people and just enjoy it. Your good news from the National Western Complex, next.
Natura Obscura would be a great band name, also a really good imperial stout. But it is actually a show at the Inglewood Museum of Outdoor Arts. Our Tom Cole grabbed his camera and headed down to give us a look. Welcome to Natura Obscura. Enter the forest. We're walking through a surrealist forest. It's sort of a dreamlike forest. There's many elements to explore, many layers. There's sound, scent, visuals. My name is Tim Vaca, and the director of programs at the Museum of Outdoor Arts. We hope that people kind of relax and leave all their baggage out outside of the experience and just sort of um, have fun and uh, reprise that sense of play that we had when we were kids. Now we're entering what we call nature's cathedral. This room is called the archive. <coughs> now we're gonna enter through the time machine. We're entering our sound gallery. This is where art is going. It's going to immersive experiences. Um, you're kind of taking that traditional museum model of you can't touch or play with anything out the window and uh, inviting you into something that is a little more dynamic. This is one of the best features. When you sit on the swing, uh, it triggers a thunderstorm reaction. We're uh, hoping that people kind of have a sense of self-discovery, um, you know, going back to nature and there's quotes throughout that you can find with this black light that might speak to you at a more deeper level. I think we want people to leave and just feel relaxed and calm and excited about what they just experienced. Tom Cole and his camera have brought us stories since Next first launched two and a half years ago. So trust this man when he says that he would like to make this exhibit his recommendation to you. Tom loved it runs through April 28th. We are headed out to the National Western Stock Show to collect your good news and to scrape your bad news off our boots. Next.
It's Friday, and you know what that means. We always end the work week with your good news, the headlines of your life. Photojournalist Corky Scholl heads to the National Western, which begins its 113th year in Denver this weekend. We're at the National Western Stock Show that starts on Saturday. It's just something to see. There's so much here that you don't see every day. I myself, this will be my fifth year. Oh, we've been probably coming out here for six years. Well, this is Andrea's this first This is my first year, first so. Year. This is our 44th straight year here. Our particular company comes from Minnesota, and so we look forward to coming and seeing the great weather. And, and everybody has such a great attitude. Everybody's so nice, no matter where they're from or what they're doing. Or It's almost like a vacation to us when they come out here. I would definitely say it's a happy time. And most of the time, it's, it's a good time to meet people that we haven't seen all year from around the country. It's good news for us because we're all outside, we're all having fun. Oh, I took a picture of a cow. It was in the pen, it looked straight ahead. But when I took a picture, the cow turned his head towards me. I was like, oh my, I've never seen a cow do that. And it was looking at me like, what are you doing? We just get excited because we're coming to Denver, Colorado and we're taking in the stock show. To us, it marks January. We look forward to it all year long. And as you know, one year starts to fold, we get excited when a new year comes because we know we're coming to the Denver Stock Show. It's a great place. This is a great place for people to bring their family and friends. This is a good place. Finish with your feedback tonight. Shanann says, so appreciate your voice calling things out without ugliness, how the trolls can find compassion. You could have called them out with a cruel response. That's what they want, Shannon. If you truly can kill them with kindness, Coloradans slew a bunch of them today over that birthday bike. See you next time.